Go ahead. All right, so I'm, um, I'm an ecologist by training, but I work at the Mathematical Biosciences Institute. Um, and I'm generally just going to talk about seed dispersal today. So it's one form of movement, by, or the form of movement by plants. So I just put uh, a quote up here that IPCC came out recently. And they said that without additional mitigation efforts beyond those in place today, and even with adaptation, warming by the end of the 21st century will lead to high to very high risk of severe widespread and irreversible impacts globally. So we know that um, anthrop anthropogenic climate change will affect um, climate, and it'll affect local climate, potentially changing the habitat of many species and making it unsuitable for those species to live there. And so species are going to have to track suitable habitats. And um, it's been estimated that as high as 60% of all animal and plant species may go extinct depending on the type of model that you use. But potentially a lot of species may be susceptible to climate change. And um, the rate at which organisms have to move to keep up with climate change has been predicted to be about 0.08 to 1.0 six kilometers per year. But plants, this is a tree, um, plants are sessile organisms, so they do not move. And the only time that they move um, is usually through seed dispersal. There are things called walking palms, but they actually don't walk. They just fall down and then re-sprout. And when people go out and measure them, they've moved. But it's, they're not walking. Um, so, let's see. All right, so, um, Plants have different plants have different ways that they get around. So these, um, which you can infer by some of their fruit traits or their morphology. So here, these um, red fruits tend to be dispersed by birds. So here, you can see the cedar waxwing is eating some fruit, but it'll be dispersing. Green fruits tend to be so in the tropics. A lot of green fruits are dispersed by primates, um, which is a and monkey there. Uh, there's seeds that have an arrow around them, which has a lot of high lipid content, which are dispersed by ants. And then there's a lot of species that are dispersed by wind. So these tend to have a pappus or wings that allow them to move. And so we can infer some of the mechanisms of movement by plants from these morphological traits. But that doesn't really give you the whole picture, because a lot of plants can disperse from the canopy and then when they hit the ground, they can be dispersed by many other things. There's a lot of rodents that disperse seeds, or water may disperse seed if there's a flooding event. Um, so, but um, so it, it's really hard to actually track where seeds are going empirically or in the field. So there's different ways that you can do that. You can try to follow. That if it's an animal dispersed seed, you can try to follow it, which can be dangerous. There's, um, if you're like running after some bird that flies really fast, and there's rabies and things. But um, there's ways you can infer how uh, seeds move through seed traps. So people put up these mesh um, traps where they collect seeds and they um, put these traps throughout whatever plot they're looking at. And then they use statistical methods to figure out how far the seeds have gone from an adult. The downside to that is you don't know from which tree the seed actually um, dispersed from because you can't identify the parent tree. Uh, so it's, it's more of an ecological maybe distance where you have an idea of how far the seed has moved from a nearest adult. And um, another way is to use genetics where you can go out and identify the, the genes of plants of the seeds or seedlings, and then you have to go and sample all the trees. But um, this can also be limited because um, you can't sample all the trees in an area. And so these, some of these methods don't get a long distance dispersal, which can be really important for the spreading of, of plant populations because you can't sample everything. Uh, there's also, you can uh, put little trackers on seeds and then um, find out how far they go from these trackers, from these GPS trackers. But, uh, so, seed dispersal, so in the context of climate change, seed dispersal is going to be important in order for plants to 
uh, be able to track these suitable environments. And it's important for two reasons. One, for population spread, so it can colonize new environments. As you can see here, it's going to places that it hasn't been before, or the species hasn't been before. <coughs> But also, it contributes to contributes to this uh, genetic diversity. So, the, uh, both pollen dispersal um, con contributes to genetic diversity and also seed dispersal. And this allows uh, for a population to be potentially better able to adapt to changes in climate in the future. Um, okay. So once a seed gets, so this is a cordia bicolor. It's a canopy tree that's distributed throughout Central and South America has these green fleshy fruits and it's germinating here in the, in the soil. So once a, once a seed gets somewhere, then it's there for the rest of its life. So it has to deal with whatever, um, whatever comes in its way. So the seed dispersal determines uh, where the plant ends up. So it determines the likelihood of reaching a, a suitable area. So in cases where the resources might be heterogeneous through time or through space, so if they're unpredictable, um, then allowing a plant allowing or it has evolved to disperse its seeds and can uh, take advantage of those unpredictable resources um, as it's spreading its seeds across this heterogeneous environment. And um, so plants rely on water and light and about 15 inorganic nutrients that they need to survive and grow. So wherever it is, that's the resources that it has. Seed dispersal also determines the neighbors that it has. So it determines how many competitors it has in the environment that are going to be competing for these resources um, and the identity of those neighbors. So whether um, they're closely related or less closely related. So if seeds don't disperse, they'll fall right underneath their tree, which means that they'll be competing with with seeds from the same mother plant to compete for those resources. Whereas if they get dispersed somewhere else, then it's less likely that they'll compete with their own. Um, and also seed dispersal determines the interactions that plants have with enemies and mutualists. So enemies are like um, seed predators. <laughs> So here you can see this is a Bruchid beetle. So Bruchid beetles are important in agricultural and natural systems. So the Bruchid beetle um, lays its egg on the seed. Um, then the egg, the larvae hatch. They drill into the seed. They consume all the, the seed that's inside, the, the seed reserve in the embryo. They emerge as adults. You can see that this adult has emerged from this hole here, there. Um, and then we don't really know where they go or what they do. Um, but these are, are important um, and tend to be specialized in different plant species. There's kind of, so this is my depiction of microorganisms. Um, these can be both pathogenic um, or, or they can be beneficial in helping the plant to grow and survive. And then there's also animals, this is a tapir in Costa Rica, which can either be detrimental depending on the plant species, it can, it may uh, eat the seed and kill it in the digestive tract or when it's munching on it, or it may be beneficial because it's dispersing it to another environment. Um, so all of these kind of local seed dispersal and then these local interactions that occur um, throughout the, the life stages of the plant determine the distributions of the plant. So here, um, so the seedscape is, um, defining as kind of the viewpoint of the seed and all the interactions it has with other organisms in the abiotic environment. And that can affect then later stages of recruitment, such as the juvenile stage and the adult stage, and the probability that that um, plant will survive and grow and produce offspring in the future. And here you can see these are different species um, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so here, this one, the, the, these are adult plants. That, and they seem to follow a ridge, so this plant seems to do well in these ridge areas. And this plant here has very clump distribution, which may be because it doesn't disperse very well, so it has limited seed dispersal. Um, uh, so, C 
seed dispersal is also important in many hypotheses for species diversity, can help promote species diversity. Um, and this, so this is just an example of a gradient of plant diversity across latitudes where, where the highest diversity is in the tropics. And I'll talk a little bit more about the role of seed dispersal diversity, at least for one hypothesis later on. And because of all the benefits that seed dispersal has for plants and that it escapes its natural enemy, that seed predators and pathogens, it escapes uh, competition with its seedling, seedlings, and it um, helps promote genetic diversity by dispersing these seeds into other populations. It's an important ecosystem function. So I'm, and I'm interested, one of the things I'm interested in is how human pressures such as hunting of large animals and habitat fragmentation, how that affects seed dispersal, seed dispersal, and then what these, um, how these may indirectly affect things we see a larger scale, such as species distribution and diversity. And so I use, a diff I use different approaches. I use both experiments, field experiments, and mathematical approaches to understand these interactions. Experiments are good to getting at very local scale processes, but if you want to scale to bigger um, spatial and and just temporal skills, then a um, mathematical model for simulations can be helpful. Okay, so the majority of plants in the tropics are dispersed by vertebrates, and half of all flowering plants are dispersed by vertebrates as well. Um, these are different examples of seed disperser. There's a bat, um, a bellbird, and a spider monkey in Panama. Um, and I'll talk more about their behaviors and how they may affect seed dispersal in a little bit. But it's been estimated that a quarter of all these vertebrate seed dispersers are threatened to extinction. And this tends to be, um, so mammals and birds and lizards on islands tend to be more susceptible than the mainland, but in general about a quarter of all these different groups of seed dispersers are threatened to extinction. So um, in a field experiment in central Panama, I looked where there's a lot of, there's a gradient of hunting and poaching. I looked to see how hunting may affect seed removal of two different plant species. So this is Cordia bicolor, this is the fruit of it that I showed before. And this is a palm Enocarpus mapora that has much larger seeds. And I set up, um, and these are actually, this is a picture from Africa, not Panama, but it just shows dead animals. Um, <laughs> so I did an experiment looking at protected sites, for, which are on Bar Barrow, Colorado Island, and um, a hunted area, which is on the mainland here in Sombrania, which has an intermediate pressure of hunting. And I set out, um, I looked at using these seed traps, I looked at seed dispersal from the canopy, and then I set out seeds on the ground to look at removal by terrestrial mammals like uh, peccaries or rodents, um, to look to see how hunting may affect seed removal. And I found that um, these, both these species had different responses. For, so for the larger seed, it's palm. Um, it had overall reduced seed dispersal, but especially at the secondary stage, or um, seed removal from the ground. So once seeds were on the ground, um, that's where most of the seeds were removed. But in hunted areas, almost no seeds were removed. For the canopy tree that had smaller seeds, this is um, the Cordia, it's dispersed by weight-faced monkeys. And I found that there was no removal from the ground in both uh, hunted and protected areas. Most of its seed dispersal is occur occurring in the canopy, because primary dispersal is uh, monkeys. And in, hu in hunted areas, it had, it had slightly lower seed dispersal, seed dispersal as well. Um, so there's been many, so this study was done in 2007, and there's been a few more studies that have been done. Um, so they did a a meta-analysis um, synthesizing a lot of the studies, the individual studies that have been done, and they looked at the effects of hunting and logging and showed that the visitation rates of animals to plants were reduced in, in these areas that had higher human pressure. The seed removal rates were reduced, so it's on this negative side, and then also the seed dispersal distances were removed. And let's see what's, okay. This is a this is important because one of one of the hypotheses for species diversity has to do with seed dispersal distances. So um, here, this graph shows 
on the, on the x-axis is the distance from the parent tree, and this is the parent tree here. Um, on this left y-axis is the density of seeds, and on the right y-axis is the probability that that seed will survive. So in this hypothesis, um, we assume that seed dispersal looks like this. So a lot of seeds get, um, or just fall underneath the tree, and then as you move further away, some seeds are dispersed, but that falls off as you move away. Then there's um, seed predators, or pathogens, or some sort of enemy that eats the seed, and it's specialized on this particular species, and it responds either to the high densities that are underneath this tree, or it's responding to the distance from the tree. So, um, so most of the mortality that's occurring by these seeds is near the tree because of the way that these seed predators and, and pathogens are responding. And so plants have evolved to, um, or are hypothesized to evolve to disperse away from the tree to escape this predation. And um, this results, and these are the seeds that then survive. So a lot of the seeds are eaten that are underneath the tree um, as they escape they form this peaked seedling distribution. And here, this is the probability that a seed survives, so you can see it approaches one as you move farther away from the seed, the tree. So this has been a hypothesis to help promote local diversity in an area, um, because, because now there's a space created here where other species can, um, can colonize and recruit, and so there can be different species that are um, that are coexisting together. So, okay. um, and so if we have hunting, then the, the seed dispersal distance is, re re is reduced, and so we might expect the seed dispersal curve to look something like this, where most of the seeds are now falling underneath the parent tree. And um, so it's been hypothesized that this can reduce survival, so if you um, integrate over all the seeds that survive, and it also um, moves this peak closer to the tree. Um, so this might mean that fewer species can coexist. Right. So um, what hasn't been, been incorporated in this too is these different behaviors that animals have. So these types of, uh, these animals that I showed earlier have behaviors that, uh, that result in these peaked distributions that are away from the plant. So they, they aggregate in areas and then basically defecate on a lot of seeds, and so they have these clump distributions. So bats have roosting sites, primates have sleeping sites where they spend a lot of time, and these bellbirds um, have display sites where they are court, where they have these courtship behaviors <coughs> and they spend a lot of time. So <coughs> these are just some examples of the of these. Um, and I'll just go through these. And so here are these sleeping sites where you can see really high. So the, these, this is all seed densities within a plot. The numbers are the parent plants and the red areas are the sleeping sites. And you can see there's high peaks and there's those sleeping sites. So I was interested to see how this would affect spatial patterns and then what we might expect for hunting. And that's kind of what I'm working on now. Um, so I have the simulation model. So in this example, um, there's a seed predator, there's pathogens, um, there's some seed dispersal of green of the seeds, the blue crosses are beetles. And um, these, these red crosses are the, what I'm calling the frugivore sites where the, fruit, the seed disperser is aggregated. And you can see that there's these clump distributions. So, um, so this is an example of the <laughs> steps of the simulation model where seeds disperse, natural enemies disperse, and then they kill seeds. And I found that with one tree, um, this, this uh, but with one, what, with one tree, this, when the, when the seed dispersers are aggregating the seeds, they, it helps the seeds escape from the natural enemies because there is the probability that that seed predator or pathogen will encounter the seed is lower. Um, and so now I'm currently introducing... Wait, can you say that again? I didn't quite understand that. Oh, so because all the, there's like more, so now in the landscape you have areas that are really high densities of seeds and other areas where there's no seeds. And my seed predators in this model are dumb. So they disperse to an area, and then if there's no seed, they die. Um, and so because seeds are now concentrated in these particular areas, it's just less likely that the seed predators are going to land in an area where there's a lot of seeds. And so those seeds, and a lot of them, will escape and survive. 
<laughs> Almost done. Um, so this is just an example that I'm not going to go through of the data. I'm wearing a lot of parameters in this model um, and trying to figure out how to um, visualize the results. And it's complicated. <laughs> um, and that's, that's it. Any questions? I guess. No, we're going to have a lot of time for questions. So.